Chapter 1 She was really going to do this. Sterling handed over all the cash in her purse. It was a considerable amount. The bank teller had eyed her with surprise when she had requested to withdraw it. Now the entire amount was going to be an investment for the biggest story of her life. In return, the flight attendant held out a uniform. There is no name badge. You will have to say you'd misplaced it. The woman pursed her lips and watched Sterling with skepticism. You read the manual I sent to you? I read it, she lied. She had skimmed it. It really was not complicated. Sterling grabbed the bundle of clothes and went into a stall. They were in the bathroom at the airport. She quickly began to strip. Besides, if he figured out she was an imposter, it was not like he could just land the plane and kick her out. He needed to get back to the city ASAP. I hope you've studied it. I could lose my job over this, the stewardess huffed. If anything happens, you need to know all the protocols. You said yourself that it's unlikely anything will go wrong. Sterling rolled her eyes. It is perfect weather out. The pilot is experienced. I just serve the passenger a couple of drinks, smile pretty, and snap some photos. No big deal. Besides, all you did was call in sick. You have no idea who would replace you. The flight attendant sighed. I am going to bitterly regret this. Think of that vacation you've been looking forward to. Sterling slipped on the skirt. It was such a sexist outfit. Why she had to wear a knee-length skirt and pumps while handing out drinks on a plane and reminding people when to put their seatbelts on was beyond her. As it was, the pumps were going to kill her feet. Sterling was a sneakers kind of girl, much easier to chase down her quarry with. Now she was going to be chasing down Jake Ramsley, the ever-elusive bachelor who was even harder to get a picture of than Michael Ramsley and Michael valued his privacy to the extreme. There were only two public photos of Jake, one in an old GQ magazine where the entire business conglomerate family had been present, and one file photo for Ramsley Insurance. Now Sterling was going to have him all to herself for a six-hour private flight. Her mouth practically watered at the thought. She was going to do a lot more than snap photos. Not that Sterling was going to tell the flight attendant who had so thoughtfully provided her with the uniform. She handed over a month's worth of wages for this opportunity, and Sterling intended to have an exclusive that would catapult her career. The bonus would more than make up for her investment. Rumor had it Jake was on his way to help the Ramsley family deal with the latest disaster. His father, Robert, and Uncle David, had been arrested by the FBI for smuggling drugs into the country on a staggering scale over decades. David had been arrested recently, and his son Michael would now be in FBI custody, charged with the same crimes. Not that the general public knew that yet. Sterling's article would hit the stands tomorrow morning, enlightening everyone to the latest in the Ramsley family drama. Sterling would never have believed it. Michael did not seem the type. Yet the FBI must have something if they were arresting him. Her source had been adamant that he would be arrested tonight, so Sterling had made up the article and submitted it to her boss, Ray Grange. She would continue to press her contacts. If Sterling could keep ahead of the regular papers with the breaking news regarding her favorite source of income, Ramsley Drama, then she would be earning more money than anyone could dream of. She might even be able to make a book out of it afterward. Sterling tugged on the jacket to get it to sit right. It was too tight. Are you ready yet? The flight attendant asked impatiently. I need to check you over. You have to look the part or the pilot will not believe it. Sterling opened the door. Help me with this silly little hat. Do you really wear it? Two minutes later, Sterling was pronounced good enough to pass inspection. Remember, the pilot's name is Richard Merriweather. There is no one else on the flight besides the three of you. Do not screw this up. The flight attendant gave Sterling a critical once-over. Stop worrying. No one will know that you were involved in this unless you tell them. Sterling grabbed her purse. She set a thick layer of red lipstick on her lips. There. I am all set. Sterling shot the flight attendant a triumphant smile and quickly exited the ladies' room before the flight attendant could get any ideas about raising her price or having any remorse. Sterling needed this to work. It had been a bit of a long shot. 
trying to set up this little operation and managing to fly out of here on time to get on Jake Ramsley's personal plane. The timing had been tricky. The fact that it was all coming together was like a shot of adrenaline for her. Sterling made her way to the correct gate, showing her ID and borrowed pass to a security guard. New here? The guard barely looked at Sterling's fake credentials. She had spent hours with a backstreet fake ID specialist to make sure the airport employee card was perfect. Yes. Sterling smiled as she took back the card. She did not volunteer any other information. That was where most other reporters got in trouble, when they were trying to scope out information. The more a person lied, the more likely they were to be found out. Sterling told the truth wherever possible. Sometimes she just embellished it a little. Only a little. Not that Sterling was a real reporter. She worked for a tabloid. That meant she was the scum of the reporting world. Even if she had outscooped some of the biggest newspaper competitors in the city. Have a nice flight, the guard motioned her through. He was as lax as the flight attendant had mentioned. Perfect. Sterling gripped the handle of her luggage case and purposefully walked down the corridor. She passed through some automatic doors and walked across the tarmac to the plane. Everything was going well. Sterling climbed the steps and entered the plane. It was small compared to the large commercial flights she was used to. Then again, it was a private plane, beautifully detailed inside with leather seats and nice decor. Jake had hired the plane since the Ramsey Corporations did not own one. Sterling wondered why he had just not flown on a commercial flight like everyone else did. Then again, he was a Ramsley. It was not that she had anything against the family. They were her bread and butter most days. If she had the money, she would travel like this all the time, too. Sterling strashed away her single suitcase. She grabbed a pre-flight checklist for the flight attendants and started to look busy. She was in the middle of checking the fire extinguishers when the pilot, Richard Merriweather, came on board. Good evening, Richard smiled at her. He was a distinguished-looking man in his mid-fifties. Good evening, Sterling echoed the greeting. She shook his hand and introduced herself, Sarah Hawkins. Pleased to meet you, Miss Hawkins. Richard Merriweather. Weather looks good today. He stowed a small bag away. It appeared the pilot traveled very light. Indeed. Sterling smiled as he made his way past her to the cockpit to start his own pre-flight checks. First hurdle done. Sterling continued with the list. Anything she did not quite understand, she put a check mark beside. She was not about to admit her ignorance. It was only a six-hour flight, so no meals were required to be served. All she had to do was fake it until they were well on their way. Footsteps came up the steps. Sterling turned to have a look, and there was Jake Ramsley, immaculate in a suit, coat draped over his arm, laptop case in hand. For a moment, Sterling could feel her heart flutter in her chest. That was silly. She had never been nervous around any of the celebrities that she chased down for a story before. Jake Ramsley was not even all that famous compared to his cousins. Sterling had every intention of changing that come tomorrow when she wrote her next article. Richard, good to see you again. Jake greeted the pilot with a nod. He turned to Sterling. Nice to meet you. Sarah Hawkins. Sterling held out a hand to greet him. Miss Hawkins? Jake said briefly before he handed her his coat. Sterling blinked. She meant to shake his hand, not do coat service. However, she pasted a smile on her face as he went to take his seat. She was invisible, just part of the help to Mr. High and Mighty Ramsley. That was fine. It would suit her purposes not to have him pay any attention to her. She put his coat and single luggage case away, ignoring the sandalwood smell. Just because he was tall, dark, and smelled good, did not mean that she was going to give him any mercy. Sterling had a job to do. Jake settled himself with his laptop and phone out, ignoring Sterling and Richard as they went about their duties. His phone rang, and he put it on speaker while he continued typing. Jake Ramsley. Sterling could not believe her luck. She tried to be inconspicuous as she listened in on the conversation. They have arrested Michael, a voice said from the cell phone. Jake stopped typing. What do you mean they've arrested Michael? The FBI. They searched Michael's house, seized his boat, and have taken him into custody, 
came the reply. Anne is beside herself. What are we going to do? Get him a really good team of lawyers? Jake was grim. Dylan, how is Dad? I tried to get an appointment to speak to him, but was denied, responded Dylan. Why? asked a frowning Jake. I asked to see him, and it came back that he did not want to talk to me. Hopefully, when you get here, he will talk to you. Dylan was frustrated. How did this even happen? What possible reason could they have to become involved with drug smugglers? We run billion-dollar businesses, not illegal activities. None of this makes any sense. Jake grimaced. You said Michael had arranged a family meeting? Yes. Michael had proof that money was being laundered out of Ramsey Pharmaceuticals. Have you checked the Western Division accounting? I got a team of auditors looking over Ramsey Insurance Eastern Division right now, and they have uncovered some disturbing things. It is possible money has been laundered through our company as well. Slow down, advised Jake. We do not know that for certain until a complete audit is made. I am worried that the FBI is going to ask for our financial records before we have even fully scratched the surface. There are over 30 years of records to go through, sighed Dylan. I'm concerned about what we could be left open to in this investigation. We did nothing wrong, Dylan, Jake said reasonably. We cannot be charged for not knowing what Uncle David and possibly our dad was up to. Dylan had a short, unamused laugh. We are the heads of this company. We're open to liability and thus charges if the FBI deems it necessary. That is part of the job. At the very least, we should have been apprised by our accounting of discrepancies. I'm pretty sure ignorance is not an acceptable defense. Jake knew that Dylan had a habit of imagining the worst. It was a strength when Dylan prepared properly for the worst and everything in between. It was also his weakness when Dylan was paralyzed by his fears. Dylan's first marriage had been something of a disaster, resulting in the anxieties he now bore. Jake was waiting to see how his second marriage went. However, it appeared that Dylan was happier with his new wife, Kelly. Dylan deserved some happiness after all he had been through, in Jake's opinion. Let's not borrow trouble, Jake responded reasonably. Right now, we audit, we get the lawyers involved, and we try to figure out how to help Dad. Sterling noted that he was not worried about helping his Uncle David. Perhaps Jake was leaving that for his cousins to sort out while concentrating on his own father. Sterling wondered just how deep each Ramsley was involved in this. It sounded like Dylan and Jake were innocent of being involved in the drug smuggling if their conversation was anything to go by. Or perhaps just Dylan was innocent and Jake was keeping his youngest brother in the dark. Have you heard from Everett? questioned Dylan. Just that he'd be flying in soon. He promised to contact me once he had an approximate rival time, replied Jake. Dylan, it will be okay. We will get this sorted out. I wish I could believe that, Dylan responded. Look, I have to go. We are having a shareholders meeting. I'm going to be in the hot seat, trying to calm some nerves over Dad. I'll see you at the airport. Give me any updates by phone. The last thing we want is the FBI misconstruing something through an email chain mentioned Jake. I will see you soon. They said their goodbyes and ended the call. Jake worked diligently at his computer, so Sterling had a moment to jot down a few notes on her cell phone. She had not learned much, but her source at the FBI had been right. Michael had been arrested. Ready to go? Richard pleasantly asked Sterling. Sterling fixed a smile on her face and shoved her phone in her jacket. Absolutely. Everything checks out. Great. If you could close the outer door, I will let the tower know that we're ready to depart. Richard went back into the cockpit, and Sterling breathed a sigh of relief. She turned to the door and studied it a moment. It was not like a regular door. There was a huge handle on it. Sterling grabbed the handle and pulled the door in. Then she shoved the handle down and felt it click into place. Giving it a push and a tug, Sterling noted it was secure. Thank goodness. The manual she had skimmed last night had not said anything on how to lock these doors, and Sterling knew that they could not fly with it open. Suddenly, she felt a little worried. Maybe she should have taken the time to read the manual properly, maybe even watch some videos on YouTube or Google procedures for flight attendants. Little things, like closing a door, could potentially trip her up and blow her cover. 
The last thing she needed was to be discovered as a fraud before they even left the airport. Her boss would eat her for dinner and spit her out. As much as she was the tabloid's rising star, Sterling had no illusions as to Ray Grange's loyalties. He cared nothing for his workers, only the bottom line of the paper which was selling them to make money. In a world where things were going digital and paper was going the way of the dinosaurs, Grange was constantly pushing his writers to make things more edgy, exaggerated, and sometimes using lies to make a profit. Sterling had managed not to lie in any of her articles. Sometimes she went a little far, she would admit that. But her writing style and suggestive comments had managed to save her from outright lying in the paper. It helped that she started the articles on the Ramsleys, and the drama had been recently unfolding, making her job a little more secure. Yet, if she did not keep giving articles that sold, she would be out on the streets in today's job market. Most people did not look on tabloid writers as very unemployable. Her best bet would be to move into the fiction market, writing books. First, Sterling needed to get as famous as possible, so people would recognize her name when she ultimately made the career switch. She was not going to be at Ray Grange's beck and call forever. Some point soon, she would be able to escape his demands and inappropriate comments. Sterling reminded Jake to fasten his seatbelt before quickly taking her own spot. She clipped the belt together as the plane started. A chirping noise came from her phone, and Sterling looked up to see if Jake had noticed. Instead, he was focused on his own electronics. She probably should have reminded him to put them away, at least during takeoff. However, he should also have flown enough flights to know better. If he got whacked on the head for his own carelessness, was she really to blame? She was probably going to make a bad flight attendant, Sterling reflected ruefully as she pulled out her phone and checked her messages. One of her sources at the police department had just tipped her that Ted Searson had died of anaphylactic shock, an allergic reaction. Sterling's fingers flew over the keys on her phone as she quickly pressed her sources at a prestigious medical center where Ted's doctor was to learn if Ted had any known allergies. She did not like the timing of this. Ted could have become a potential witness against David Ramsley, except now he was conveniently dead. Her eyes widened as the next message came through. David Ramsley had been released. How was that even possible? Sterling scrolled down the message, reading as the plane began to speed up down the runway. David had agreed to testify against his son Michael, brother Robert, and Ted Searson in exchange for immunity. He would not need to testify against Ted anymore, Sterling reflected. Sterling had included the possibility that David might testify against the others in her tabloid article on a hunch. She was amazed that it was correct. It did not feel right. Sterling felt that if any of them were guilty, it was David. She had met David Ramsley at a fundraising dinner at Mercy Hospital. He was arrogant, rude, and smug. David gave the impression that he could do or say whatever he wanted without any repercussions. Sterling felt that he was the epitome of all that was wrong with rich old men. They thought they ruled the world and everyone else was simply there to serve him. Sterling detested those types of men. A chime alerted Sterling to the fact that seatbelts were no longer a requirement. Shoving her phone into her pocket, Sterling unclipped her belt. With a smile fixed on her face, she reminded Jake that he had no longer had to wear his seatbelt and asked if he would like anything at this time. Thankfully, he said no, which was a good thing because Sterling had yet to familiarize herself with where everything was on the plane. If he had ordered whiskey or something, she would not even know if they had anything in stock. Vowing to ignore her phone, Sterling began to poke curiously into cupboards, shifting things around until she knew where everything was. Jake ignored her. Sterling ignored Jake, somewhat. He was not conventionally handsome. He might be tall, four inches taller than Sterling's impressive five-foot-ten stature, but he was a little thin. He also had a craggy face. Whatever that really meant, Sterling did not know but she decided the word craggy suited Jake. Maybe if he ever smiled, he might be handsome, but right now he was simply serious and all too male. Sterling tried to ignore him while waiting for any morsel of what would fit into her next article. 
she wondered if she should start asking him annoying questions in a clueless fashion to see what he might say. Deciding to save that for later, Sterling poured herself a small measure of white wine and enjoyed it in the tiniest kitchen she had ever been in. That was saying something, since she had been in her Uncle Jim Bob's motor home, and it had a miniaturized kitchen all its own. Sterling had come a far away, from a tiny nothing town of perhaps 800 people, if one were being generous, all the way to the big city as a writer. Okay, tabloid writer. She could handle that as long as it kept paying the bills and catapulted her career into something higher. Wait, were flight attendants allowed to drink on the job? There was no way to pour it back into the bottle without making a mess. Plus, it was the good stuff. No way was she going to pour it down the drain. With a grimace, Sterling kicked back the last of the wine like a shot. She sighed over the fact that she had barely gotten a good taste of the last large gulp. Rough day? a voice said from behind her. Sterling gasped and turned around. You were supposed to be flying the plane! Richard had a smile as he reached past her into the fridge for a bottle of water. Autopilot. Yes, but if something goes wrong... Sterling gave a speaking look at his chair, where that was just visible through the cockpit door. You need to be there to fix it. Relax. Richard shrugged and uncapped his bottle. Nothing is going to go wrong. Sterling watched him return to the cockpit with a wary eye. She could see the headline now. Pilot jeopardizes billionaire Jake Ramsley's life all for a bottle of water. Richard would probably get fired. Then again, that headline was not as good as Ted Searson dead in jail after possible poisoning from best friend pharmaceutical chain owner David Ramsley. David released as FBI frame son Michael for father's deeds. Sterling grabbed her phone and typed a few headline ideas in start of a new article. Three hours later, she had outlined a couple of article ideas, penned an article, and managed to snap a couple photos on her cell phone of Jake without his being any the wiser. And she was distinctly bored. Jake had not received any more calls and was assiduously working away at the laptop. Sterling decided to ask Jake once again if there was anything that he required. This time, she was able to get him a bottle of water. How dull. She grabbed a glass, put in some ice, and brought it, a coaster, and a napkin, and the bottle of water over to him, setting it down on the desk. No one would ever complain about that level of service. Just the bottle is fine, Jake said distractedly. Sterling kept her smile pasted on and whisked away the ice napkin and coaster. She entered the kitchen, putting the items away and taking another small sample of wine for herself when she heard a curse from the cabin. Hurriedly gulping down the wine, Sterling tossed the glass into the bin and went into the cabin. Sir, is something wrong? Jake glared at the computer screen. No. Something was very wrong if his expression was anything to go by. Sterling really wanted to know what he was looking at. She looked at his water bottle. It had barely been touched. Jake probably was not going to go to the bathroom any time soon. Maybe she could, if she just innocently looked at the screen as she walked past. Have you ever heard of Sterling Denver? Jake asked disgustedly. She's a tabloid writer, right? Sterling responded with just the right tinge of curiosity and confusion. Yes. Jake practically spit out the word. A friend has sent me tomorrow's article, then she has outdone herself again. How does she know these things? Sterling eased herself to stand beside Jake and look at the screen. There was tomorrow's article that she had just submitted a few hours ago. Michael Ramsley arrested by FBI. Boat seized, house ransacked. Pregnant wife Anne in tears after Michael Ramsley was arrested last night by the FBI in a drug smuggling investigation. Rumors that Father David will turn against son, set to testify against Michael, Robert Ramsley, and family friend Ted Searson in return for immunity. Searson is accused of attempting to murder his own daughter, Bethany, who is rumored to have moved in with Detective Andrew Colburn Ramsley, illegitimate son of David. What a soap opera! Can the Ramsleys withstand the drama as stocks of the family companies take a dramatic drip? Or will this be the ruin of a once powerful and wealthy clan? Sure, it was a little dramatic, but everything was factual. 
she had written far more inflammatory articles. I'm sure that she has her sources somewhere, offered Sterling. She's a menace to society, growled Jake, feeding off of other people's pain. Really? Were they really in pain? They had billions of dollars, the best legal team that money could purchase, and would probably be able to buy their way out of any conviction. If the FBI thought that they were guilty, there was some very strong probability that they were. Well, David, Robert, and Ted were guilty. Sterling did not believe that Michael was anything but a fall guy. Then again, it was not like she had the opportunity to look at all the evidence. No one would, except a jury. I think she's entertaining, Sterling ventured to defend herself just a little to keep the conversation going. She ought to go to jail for libel, Jake snorted. He switched the screen to some boring data analysis reports. She would never go to jail for libel. Sterling asked the lawyers downstairs all the time how much she could push the envelope before getting sued. Rolling her eyes, she headed for the front of the plane when a scene outside the window caught her eye. There were mountains with trees. Lots of trees. Rather close to the plain. Sterling frowned. Getting closer to the window, she peered out. What is wrong? A distracted Jake asked, alerted by her behavior that something was amiss. I think you should put on your seatbelt, Sterling said with some trepidation. Those trees were blurs as they whipped past. They were definitely getting closer. She pushed away from the window and tried to push down the panic growing inside of her. Excuse me? Jake looked out the window. He gasped in disbelief. We were supposed to be past the mountains hours ago. What is going on? Put on your seatbelt, Sterling repeated over her shoulder as she opened the cockpit door. Richard? Richard was slumped over the controls, his fingers spasmodically clicking buttons. An odd sound escaped him. A shriek escaped Sterling. She grabbed the pilot, yanking him upright in his seat, holding onto his heavy frame as his eyes rolled up in his head, and he slumped limply against her. The weight of Richard's body caused Sterling to stumble, and she grabbed him firmly. The plane began to dive. Pushing Richard back into the seat, she sat on his lap and grabbed the thing that looked a little like a cross between a joystick and a steering wheel, pulling back on it ever so gently. Sterling took quick little breaths, scared out of her wits. "'What are you two doing?' Jake glowered in the doorway. "'This is not the time for kinky stuff.' "'I think he's having a heart attack or something,' she practically yelled at Jake. How he headed half of a huge American corporation when he could not see what was happening right now or follow simple directions like putting on a seatbelt and staying seated, she did not know. There is no one flying the plane. You are flying the plane, Jake frowned at her. I am not a pilot, growled Sterling. Now slap him around some that he'll wake up and do his job. I don't think that's how it works, Jake looked at Richard. He is turning blue. Do you know first aid? Which meant Jake did not know first aid. Sterling took a deep breath and tried to remember back to the single course she took back in high school. Can you fly the plane? What? No! Jake looked at her like she had an alien growing out of her head. Just grab the stick thingy and hold it steady, Sterling pointed. Easy! And when we want to land or turn? Jake reached out and held the sting earring mechanism. Sterling squeezed between Jake and Richard. We will radio air traffic control and I'm sure they can walk us through it. At least she hoped so. That was if she could figure out what part of the radio was out of all the electronics on the dash. Have you put in a mayday? Jake asked a little desperately as the plane swooped a little. He tried to hold the stick steadier. No, grunted Sterling as Richard fell halfway out of his seat, pinning Sterling's legs against the co-pilot chair. She grunted and tugged on the man, laying him flat on the floor. Kneeling beside him, Sterling pressed her cheek near his nose trying to feel for any breathing sounds. "'Is he breathing?' Jake asked as he carefully sat down in the pilot chair. Sterling tried not to roll her eyes. "'Concentrate on driving the plane.' "'I think it's called flying the plane, not driving,' Jake corrected her. 
Excuse me, grammar police. Sterling put two fingers to Richard's throat, trying to find a pulse. She moved her fingers around, but found nothing. Great. She was going to have to bluff her way through CPR. Sterling tried to remember what to do. Okay. Tilt head. Pinch nose. What are you doing? Jake questioned as the plane took another swoop motion. Sterling swallowed hard as the contents of her stomach did not appreciate the maneuver. Maybe she should not have had those two glasses of wine. I am trying CPR if we would just shut up and drive the plane straight. I am flying straight, Jake said defensively. It is turbulence or something. It is every time you turn around to see what I'm doing, she shot back. I bet you cannot look at scenery and drive straight on a roadway either. I have a personal driver, Jake countered, and who looks at scenery anyways? Jake Ramsley was exactly the guy who needed to look at scenery and remember that the world was not all about him and data sheets, Sterling thought. She took a deep breath, sealed her mouth over Richard's, and pushed air into his lungs. Or at least she tried to. The experience left her own lungs and throat aching as no air moved anywhere. Sterling lifted her head and looked down at Richard with puzzlement. She had tilted his head, pinched his nose, opened his mouth. Was there something she was missing? How was he doing? Jake inquired as another swoop happened, followed by a couple of smaller swoops. Just dandy, Sterling said sarcastically. Richard is ready to get up and fly the plane. No need to be rude, he responded. Sterling moved her knee for a better position and found something hard. Distracted, she gave it a glance, pulling a large round mint out from under her knee. Looking around, she could see other mints scattered on the floor. No, Sterling breathed. What? Jake asked with some alarm. Sterling ignored him, got to her feet, and raced for the first aid kit. Grabbing a flashlight, which was stored with the kit, she turned it on and came back to Richard. Tilting his head, she looked down his throat as best she could. She did not see anything. Ew. Sterling screwed up her face and stuck her finger down Richard's mouth, trying to see if she could feel anything that should not be there. What? Jake asked again. What is it? I think he choked on a mint, revealed Sterling as she kept feeling and was rewarded with a hard surface. Maybe it was his tonsils. Maybe it was the mint. How was she supposed to know? Was she supposed to do the Heimlich thingy on an unconscious person? Although, if he did not have a pulse and was not breathing, didn't that make him a dead person? Sterling gulped and tried to quell her nauseous stomach. She had her finger down the throat of a dead guy. She had her lips on a dead guy. Do something, ordered Jake. Sterling gave him a dirty look. Not that Jake could see it since he was flying the plane. Her eyes widened as she looked out the window. Is that fog? Clouds, I think, responded Jake uncertainly. I don't think we should fly into that. Sterling felt a fissure of fear dance its way down her back. How do I avoid it? Jake gave her an incredulous look. Move the stick? Sterling motioned with her hands. The plane took a dive. Not that fast. Would you like to drive? He groused as he pulled back slowly on the steering mechanism. I thought you were flying, grammar man. Sterling decided to try chest compressions. Maybe they might dislodge the mint, since she could not manage to get it out with her finger. She mumbled a few lines from an old song of the Bee Gees. Are you singing Staying Alive? Jake turned and looked at her in utter surprise. Watch where you are going, Sterling huffed as she pumped Richard's chest. It's to keep time. Otherwise I could sing Another One Bites the Dust by Queen. You are demented, Jake said as he swung back to look out the window. The beat of the song is the optimum rhythm for CPR. Sterling shot back. It is one of the few things she remembered from her first aid group other than wrapping her mummy up like a mummy with her group. They wasted 42 rolls of gauze in the effort and scribbled all over the guy in permanent marker, declaring it a body cast and calling him Dummy Mummy Meets Tree on Ski Hill. The teacher had not been amused. It's all right. It's okay. The ambulance is on the way. 
It's all right. It's okay. EMS will save the day, Serling sang under her breath. You got a mint stuck in your throat, but do not take note, because I'm keeping you alive. Keeping you alive. What are you doing? Demanded Jake. I don't remember the words, so I'm making up new ones. Sterling was starting to sweat and run out of breath. This was hard work. Can you figure out where the radio is and call on a mayday? That is your job, protested Jake. What does radio even look like? I am a little busy, Sterling puffed. Wrinkling her face, she swiped her finger down in Richard's throat again, hoping to find the candy loose so that she could just grab it. No luck. Mayday, mayday, Jake said into what looked like an old CB set. Nothing happened. Did you press the button? questioned Sterling. She remembered her brother used to have a set of walkie-talkies where you had to press the button to speak. Yes. Jake grabbed the steering stick suddenly with both hands as a bad patch of turbulence hit. The three of them bounced around the cockpit. I don't think I should be doing both things at one time. It's like distracted driving. Not like anyone is going to give you a ticket 15,000 feet in the air. Sterling grabbed Jake's seatbelt and began belting him in. What are you doing? Jake twitched away from her. We are putting on our seatbelts before either one of us is seriously injured. Sterling leaned close to clip the belt. A fissure of awareness went through her, and she put it down to their situation. Everyone knew senses were heightened during an adrenaline rush. Right now, she could smell Jake's cologne, and it was heavenly. I thought I told you not to go into the clouds. Was there a choice? Jake growled. What about the pilot? She pushed away from him and got into the co-pilot seat as another round of turbulence hit. Clutching her seatbelt, Sterling quickly fastened it. Richard is dead. How do you know that? You can't just give up on him. Jake was white-knuckling the stick, and it bucked in his hands and the plane jumped up and down. He is, and I did, Sterling said shortly. She grabbed the radio thingy and pressed the button. Mayday, mayday. Nothing happened. See, Jake said triumphantly. Sterling rolled her eyes. She fiddled with the dials on the radio, and it emitted a burst of static. Mayday! Mayday! This time, they heard static and nothing else. Sterling repeated the call, then fiddled with the dials again. There should be a frequency they should be on, perhaps? Is there a book on your side? Sterling rifled through the co-pilot area, looking for any sort of manual that might tell her what frequency to set the radio to. I do not have time to look for a book. Jake stated firmly, nor is it time to be reading something when we have a plane to fly. I meant we should look for the radio manual. I will do it myself. Sterling huffed as she undid her seatbelt and started looking through all the compartments in the cockpit. As she found manuals and checklists, she skimmed through them, tossing what she did not need on the floor. Why do you not know where the list is? He questioned. You are the flight attendant. This is pilot stuff. Sterling said curtly. She had no idea if a flight attendant was supposed to know where everything was in the cockpit. The good thing was that Jake did not seem to know either. The plane jumped and bucked. Sterling fell, knocking her knee on the console. Ignoring the pain, she grabbed at anything to keep her in place as the turbulence threw them around. Jake made an inarticulate noise as the clouds parted to reveal the side of a mountain dangerously close and coming closer as they flew towards it. Pull up, Sterling shouted as she launched herself into the co-pilot chair, struggling with the seatbelt straps. Pull up! Jake yanked on the stick, and the plane tilted, pushing them backwards into their seats. If you enjoy Chapter 1 of Stranded with the Billionaire, Book 6 of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for Chapter 2. These books are also available on Amazon. Just look for the Ramsley Brothers series by Josephine Bintema. They're for sale as ebooks in Kindle Unlimited, also as paperbacks, and on Audible. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to the channel. Then you will not miss out on further videos about the Ramsley Brothers series. Have a great day and happy listening!